for this session uh, we have a few topics to be taken i'll try and keep the session as short as possible because a few of you have interviews lined up from tomorrow so the first topic is going to be about the one rank one pension scheme about which there has been a lot of controversy so can anyone here explain what one rank one pension exactly is in one sentence one line if a person retires at the same level he should get the same uh, that's not the definition which you would give in front of the interview board who who's going to give me a perfect definition for one rank one pension yes Someone else, someone else who is going to define it the way you are going to show it, say it in the front of the interview board. Yes. Sir, uh, one rank one pension means the retired personnel get the uh, same uh, pension irrespective of the service he has served in the uh, job. Okay. Anyone else who wants to just better it? Same length of service. Same length of service. Okay. So the one rank one pension, if I have to say, it ensures payment of uniform pension. to service personnel those who are retiring at the same rank with same length of the service irrespective of the date of their retirement right this is a very precise clean definition of one rank one pension that means any service personnel who is retiring would be getting the same amount of pension irrespective of the date which he is retiring if the rank at which he is re retired and the number of years which he has served is the same right this is one rank one pension now first of all you have to understand that what is the cause behind this entire controversy or what is the basis of one rank one pension right and especially for the armed forces why is it so important now when you look at the indian armed forces or armed forces across the world in order to maintain young armies most of the armed forces keep a certain retirement age that's this is a norm which is followed across the world and which ranges anywhere between 30 to 40 years this is to ensure that the army is young and fit to fight for the nation right now since you are going to make a person retire at the age of 35 or 40 you would obviously have to provide him with certain benefits for his life so that he is motivated to join the armed forces yes now because of this particular reason only there are pensions which are provided to the employees in fact if i have to quote the supreme court of india in a judgment in 1996 in fact not in 1996 i think maybe uh, a little earlier to that i'm not sure uh, maybe it was in i noted it down somewhere okay so uh, the the supreme court of india in a judgment in 1983 uh, had mentioned that pension is not a bounty uh, is not a bounty or it is not dependent on the sweet will of the employer rather it is the right of the employee in lieu of the service which he has provided to the government or to the nation for his life now this comes more true in case of the armed forces where one as i said the retirement age is significantly much earlier or is significantly lesser than the retirement age in the civil services or elsewhere second the risk of life being in the services is also in the armed forces also much greater so if you look at the casualty rate for example the ratio of the casualty rate in the armed forces is 19 is to 1 for the officers to the jawans fighting in the border areas the casualty rate is 19 is to 1 perhaps one of the reasons for such a highly skewed ratio is also because you have significantly large number of jawans those who are serving at the border post compared to the officers but it would be a travesty if a officer say retired in 
and he gets pension lesser than a JCO or someone who retired at a rank lesser than him in say 2020. This is what is currently happening in the Indian Armed Forces. That people, those who retired, say for example, the pay commission recommendations, the last pay commission recommendations were implemented in 2006 with certain areas. So the recommendations came out, the report of the six pay commission came out in 2006. Right? Even though it was implemented a little later, the same is going to happen with the seventh pay commission. The recommendations have come out now. They are going to be implemented maybe two or three years or four years later. But the employees are going to get their salaries in arrears from the date of the or the uh, date or the time when the recommendations of the sixth pay commission or the seventh pay commission have come out. Similarly, people those who must have retired before 2006 when the six pay commission recommendations came would be at a significant disadvantage because the pay commission revises the salaries by a significant amount. This was especially true of the six pay commission which revised the salaries by a significant amount. So if you would have retired in 2005, there is a high probability that say if you retired at the rank of a colonel from the Indian army and someone who might have retired at the rank of say a captain or a major or even a major subedar might be getting more pension in the year 2020 than you would be getting compared to that person right now what what are the reasons for which the protest has been happening so if you look at it uh, india had the one rank one pension scheme prior to the implementation of the recommendations made by the third pay commission right now after the third pay commission came into being and third pay commission looked into the kind of uh, disparity which existed between the salaries of the uh, civil servants and the armed forces and whether the one rank one pension should be there or not it said that one rank one pension should should be discontinued there were a number of reasons uh, behind the recommendation of the third pay commission you need not go into that because that's pretty historic in terms of and that's way, way too technical also but if for your reference you could just understand that it was not always that india did not have one rank one pension we had one rank one pension prior to 1969 i think uh, when the third pay commission came out with its recommendations now once the one rank one pension was done away with this uh, movement or this demand from the civil uh, from the people from the armed forces was there for a long time for a very simple reason that they feel that they are discriminated against when they are compared to people serving in the civil services or in the other government departments because these people get to serve for 60 years and they have a job security and they can fetch for themselves and they have a livelihood Whereas when you compare it to the people, those who are serving in the armed forces, one, as I said, that they are putting their lives to risk and second, that they would be right, uh, retiring at significantly lesser age and therefore they would not have any, any avenues associated with them once they retire. Right. So what are the arguments which are put forward by the soldiers with respect to the one rank one pension? So one is the issue of what is one rank one pension. The second is that you have to understand that where does the entire problem in a way comes from and what is the source of the problem. And then we move on to what are the arguments which are for getting one rank one pension in the armed forces. One is that the section 47 of the disability act actually provides some sort of an immunity to the civil servants which is actually not provided to the personnel of the armed forces where in case of a disability a person cannot be removed from service this is what the civil uh, the disability act in the section 47 of the disability act says so if you uh, clearly look into your uh, notes which have been provided to you it says that civil servants are protected under the section 47 of the disability act and they cannot be discharged by the government on the accountability of the disability until they reach the retirement age this section doesn't apply to the defense forces and thus they can be discharged anytime on account of disability one is that second is that in order to keep the army young as i said the retirement age of the armed forces in the country is significantly lesser when compared to the civil services now this also could be justified by statistics as your notes say that a sepoy who retired okay uh, this is that uh, 
एक एज का था यस सो द रिटायरमेंट एज ऑफ द सिविल सर्वेंट्स इज 60 इयर्स 85 परसेंट ऑफ द सोल्जर्स आर कंपल्सरी रिटायर्ड बिटवीन 35 एंड 37 सेवन ईयर्स ऑफ एज वेयर एज अनादर ट्वेल्व टू थर्टीन परसेंट सोल्जर्स एक्चुअली रिटायर बिटवीन द एज ऑफ फोर्टी टू फिफ्टी फोर राइट सो दीज आर द टू मेजर आर्ग्यूमेंट देन अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट यू हैव टू ऑल्सो मेंटेन द मोरल ऑफ योर आर्म फोर्सेज इन ऑर्डर टू इंश्योर द सिक्योरिटी ऑफ द नेशन एंड देन as i said that supreme court also in its previous rulings has said that the pension which is provided by the state to its personnel whether the civil servants or people working in various government departments or in the armed forces it is not a bounty or it is not uh, being given as a free aid right it's not a charity which the government is doing rather it is their duty to be giving these people to fetch for their livelihood after retirement uh, apart from that uh, even the supreme court recently uh, in february had uh, given a ruling that uh, the one rank one pension should be implemented as soon as possible right now there are a large number of arguments which are there as far as the one rank one pension is concerned one is that it is going to cost the exchequer a lot of money so uh, it says the estimates conservatively say that 8 to 10000 crores is the amount of money which the central government would have to spend if uh, the one rank one pension is implemented for the armed forces and this is just a one time cost which we are talking about there are going to be a large number of recurring costs which are going to occur simply because of a reason that now seventh pay commission has come out so you will have to revise the salaries as well as the pensions as per that then the eighth pay commission will come out similarly you will have to revise the salaries and the pensions and so on and so forth right apart from that uh, what might also happen is that once you give the one rank one pension to the central armed forces there might be demand from the civil centrally armed police forces that's the sorry paramilitary forces right uh, whether it is the uh, bsf or the crpf etc might start demanding the same amount of money for a very simple reason that if the armed forces say that they are putting their lives at risk for the nation the same goes true for the paramilitary forces the same goes true for the police forces the same goes true for almost anyone who is in the security function of the state right uh apart from that no other country in the world if you look at it uh in in practicality has one rank one pension so whether it is uh, united kingdom whether it is uh, china pakistan france united states of america france any of these big countries which have uh, uh, one of the largest armies in the world none of them have one rank one pension so why should it be implemented in india i'll come to the counter argument to that a little later but you just hold on to that thought that no country in the world has one rank one pension this could perhaps be put out at a, as a question also to you as uh, in the interview board that uh, when no country in the world has one rank one pension then why are indian soldiers the only one those who are demanding one rank one pension simply because of a reason that the norm of early retirement is applicable to almost all the armed forces across the world and uh, the casualty factor is also almost as high across all the armed forces of the world so then on what basis could one justify a demand like one rank one pension and uh, apart from that another argument which is put forward against the one rank one pension is that there are a large number of allowances which are already provided to the members of the armed forces whether it is in the form of the subsidy to the canteens or they get their rations and so and so forth in fact uh, your uh, notes also mention that you have high altitude and uncongenial climate allowance ash and glacier allowance flying pay casualty allowance and uh, special forces pay and so and so forth so then what is the need for providing one more allowance in form of one rank one pension right now coming back to that argument that well all the other countries do in the world do not have one rank one pension so then why the indian armed forces let us first look at our neighbors china and pakistan which have one of the largest armies in the world both of them do not have one rank one pension but unofficially there are a large number of benefits which are provided to their soldiers post retirement in form of allowances and pays and so and so forth and so many other things uh, for example in china the administration ensures that civil jobs are provided 
to the senior members of the armed forces right similarly in pakistan also even though again uh, there has been a demand from the pakistani armed forces also for one rank one pension but the amount of benefits uh, or the uh, the number of benefits which are enjoyed by the soldiers there in that country is significantly much more than what is uh, given to the soldiers in this country apart from that even if you move on to countries like say united states of america United States of America has a proper rehabilitation program for once the soldiers retired from the armed forces and uh, they are provided some sort of training and subsidies provided and then they are tried to, uh, uh, the government tries to inculcate them or rehabilitate them back into the civil uh, life through various means by either helping them open their own enterprises or finding jobs for them or uh, there are a numer there are numerous opportunities for the armed forces officers in or the retired armed forces officers in uh, various jobs in security organizations and so on and so forth and all that uh, the only country which comes the closest to the one rank one pension or in terms of one rank one pension to what's being demanded in India is the United Kingdom where in United Kingdom also the uh, one rank one pension is actually not being strictly implementable and uh, it's just that the revision of the salaries uh, and the pensions keeps taking place at a much frequent rate and again the state ensures that uh, the post retirement life of the soldiers is taken well care of so uh, these these are some of the arguments and counter arguments as far as one rank one pension is concerned well if you look at it uh, purely from an economical point of view a lot of it might not make sense but uh, when you look at it from uh, uh, the uh, emotional point of view when you look at it from an ethical point of view and from a number of other uh, 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 aspects you would realize that perhaps one rank one pension has to be implemented as soon as possible as i said that supreme court of india has already said that it should be implemented apart from that uh, this government and number of other governments have been promising the soldiers that uh, one rank one pension would be implemented in fact one of the major uh, planks of the election speech for uh, the prime minister before the elections was that one rank one pension would be implemented in the earnest honesty and so on and so forth but again the uh, government dilly dallied a lot uh, once it came to power and then there were protests and then finally government acceded to the implementation of the one rank one pension now in spite of the government giving a go ahead for the implementation of the one rank one pension there are a lot of grievances which are there from the uh, end of the protesting officers and the soldiers right so what are they can anyone tell what what are the grievances which are put forward by the soldiers that's what soldiers are saying presently it's five years what are the soldiers saying they are saying that it should be revised every year which seems to be practically very uh, difficult to implement for a very simple reason that uh, in fact, that's one of the back, uh, drawbacks also of implementing the one rank one pension that in order to uh, determine who's going to get what salary and so on and so forth, it's going to be very difficult and it's going to be a huge administrative task. And what would might what might just happen is that the government might uh, end up uh, being uh, uh, drawn into a large number of litigations in the court. Uh, why? Because post uh, pre 1980s, 1990s, we did not have a lot of electronic and digitized records. Right, so all of uh, those records and pensions and everything is now actually being paid uh, through uh, the physical documents and a lot of uh, paperwork. Now in order to ensure and to calculate that what is going to be the arrear for this particular person and then how much money should he be getting and then what is going to be uh, the salary or uh, the pension which he is going to get now and so on and so forth is going to be very difficult in a country where uh, uh, physical infrastructure still remains to be very poor uh, expecting and the b pace of the working of the bureaucracy remains to be very slow it's uh, going to be very difficult and a huge administrative task to implement such a thing and then on top of that if you say that uh, the salaries and the pensions uh, and the pension should be revised every year then it's going to make uh, life uh, really tough for the uh, bureaucracy and for the government then apart from that uh, 
another argument or the another point of contention which uh, remains to be uh, between the officers or the protesting soldiers and the government is the uh, the demand for a multi member commission in order to look into the grievances and uh, the kind of complaints which they have against uh, the uh, scheme uh, or uh, the disputes with regard to one pen pen uh, one rank one pension government has said that there is going to be a one member commission whereas uh, the armed forces personnel are saying that it should uh, uh, be a multi member commission where there should be representation from the armed forces also and not uh, plainly or simply a civilian or a bureaucrat should be sitting out there uh, they are also uh, protesting or they are still uh, having their uh, doubts over who all would be included in one rank one pension. This also remains to be one of the very contentious issues uh, where the government is saying that uh, the, uh, the voluntary retirement and the premature retirements etc. would not be included as a part of the one rank one pension. The officers have been saying that uh, the war widows, the uh, the premature retired uh, uh, armed personnel forces, uh, armed personnel, armed forces personnel, as well as uh, people those who have taken voluntary retirement should be covered under this, right? And uh, then another uh, major point of uh, contention remains to be the fixation of the uh, pays. So. As your notes also read out, I'll just read it out. It says that veterans want pension of old retirees to be fixed at par with the new retirees. And uh, whereas the government is saying that it would actually be an average of the maximum and the minimum of the current retirees. So obviously the average would be significantly lesser than uh, the amount which will be fixed if it's at par with the pension of the new retirees. So this remains to be actually one of the major bone of contention between the government and the protesting soldiers. Now, what is the way ahead? See, first of all, the uh, government had made a promise. It was a part of the manifesto. And uh, now when the government has already taken half the step of uh, coming and saying that uh, the one rank one pension should be implemented, it uh, should be quick to dispose of all the standing matters which are there with the uh, in consultation with the protesting soldiers simply because of a reason that it's not the wisest of the ideas to keep the members of your armed forces at bay for such long and lead up to frustration amongst them right because uh, armed forces is a very close and well-knit community and anything which happens or any any protest which is happening or which is being made by the retired uh, soldiers or the retired officers is surely going to have an impact on the morale of the armed forces serving at our borders also so therefore the quicker and the sooner this issue is resolved and disposed of the better it would be not only for the government for the armed forces but overall for the entire uh, well-being of the nation right as far as uh, the economic cost of this particular expense is concerned well uh, this is a, a harsh reality that you have to spend on defense and uh, this is also a harsh reality when you look at uh, the amount of money which is being spent in budgets and etc so the our defense expenditure has uh, proportionately been going up and even though unfortunately we have not been spending a lot on the capital expenditure in uh, defense also i will not call it capital expenditure but on weapons and uh, modernization etc but uh, this still remains to be one of the problems uh, which we will have to face for time being and uh, there is perhaps no solution out of it. So the better it would be for the government that uh, the one rank one pension scheme is implemented as soon as possible. This is what my view is. If you want to take a purely economical view and an economic perspective, there are a large number of articles and uh, arguments which are there against uh, the one, uh, one rank one pension which you can find on the internet. But uh, again, I think... Uh, uh, I feel that uh, looking at all the aspects and looking at it in a very balanced manner, it would be prudent for the government to take the step to is 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 uh, resolve all the issues. But at the same time, perhaps uh, some of the demands which are being made by the soldiers also are uh, a little impractical, as I said, uh, demanding that the uh, equalization of the pension should be happening every year. That's not something which is practically feasible. So perhaps they also need to uh, walk the long step and uh, therefore come closer to the government in terms of resolving the issue. But I want to the 
diversification yeah diversification in the commission is one step which should be done i mean having one so uh, what could be the low hanging fruits well the first one is the uh, one uh, man commission should be replaced with a multi member commission at least uh, that uh, grievance of the armed forces would be resolved another is that uh, whether uh, people those who are taking voluntary retirement and this and that so perhaps government could come out with a certain amount of certain policy that people those who retired after uh, serving these many years in the armed forces and take voluntary retirement would be falling under oro pn those who did not would uh, fall out of a chambit so these are some of the low hanging fruits which are there which the government should ensure uh, that these are implemented in the first place and then it could resolve the other pending issues yes sorry no 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 civilians say civilians do not read uh, civil servants do not need one rank one pension for a simply yeah point was that every year the revision is done for other services and why not again which uh, revision happens it happens only after the pay commission comes in and the pay commission comes in after every 10 years increment but not really increment in the salary increment in this wo to armed forces mein bhi hota hai nahi wo pay aap dekho agar aapne ha नहीं 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 इंक्रीमेंट तो हर साल सबका ही होता है इंक्रीमेंट वो एक अलग चीज है इंक्रीमेंट इज अ वेरी डिफरेंट कॉन्सेप्ट एंड वो भी हर साल दैट्स नॉट अ मैटर ऑफ राइट दैट आई शुड गेट एन इंक्रीमेंट दैट्स नॉट अ मैटर ऑफ राइट द थिंग इज दैट देर इज अ पे बैंड विच इज देयर इफ यू लुक इन टू द सैलरी देर इज पे बैंड फोर थ्री टू वन एंड दिस इज हाउ इट गोज राइट so pay bands are there and there, there are salaries within the pay band so there would be pay band 4 if i am not wrong is 19000 19 and a half 15000 to 39500 that's the basic salary in the pay band 4 so basic salary aapki revise hoti rehti hai as you get keep getting promoted and you keep spending more number but uh, revision kisi ka nahi hota har saal and it is not a matter of right also that increment would happen every year right okay now let's move on to the next uh, topic which is about sports betting and the uh, cricket uh, governance and cricket and so on and so forth right you know number from other services even if the pay commission is a recommendation from police services in inclusion of members of hand to karo बट हाउ सी द थिंग इज ये मैं इस ये दूसरी कमीशन की बात कर रहा हूँ ये वन मेंबर कमीशन रिस्पेक्ट टू वन रैंक वन पेंशन की बात कर रहा हूँ मैं सेवन्थ पे कमीशन हाँ वो ठीक है वो एक अलग बात है वो दैट्स अनदर इशू रिलेटेड टू सेवन्थ पे कमीशन उसको वहाँ पे डील करो वो टाइम सेंग इज वन रैंक वन पेंशन की जहाँ तक बात हो रही है गवर्नमेंट हैज मेड अ वन मेंबर कमीशन एंड दे आर सेंग दैट इट शुड बी अ मल्टी मेंबर कमीशन वेर यू शुड हैव रिप्रेजेंटेशन फ्रॉम दी आर्म फोर्सेज आप कैसे मतलब ब्यूरोक्रेसी और एक ब्यूरोक्रेट को आपने रख दिया और अपने आदमी को और उसको बोला कि अब आप डिसाइड करो डिस्प्यूट सो दैट्स नॉट फेयर राइट ओके नाउ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट्स टॉक अबाउट स्पोर्ट्स बेटिंग ओके सो स्पोर्ट्स बेटिंग इन जनरल एज वेल एज इन क्रिकेट नाउ द रीजन वाई दिस टॉपिक कम्स अप इज ऑब्वियसली बिकॉज ऑफ द मैक्स मैच फिक्सिंग इशू एंड दिस एंड दैट एंड एवरीथिंग प्लस अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट द लोधा पैनल विच हैड बीन created by the supreme court and then the recommendation which it gave out one of the most important recommendations was to uh, legalize uh, the match fixing <laughs> betting betting in sports okay so it said that uh, legalize uh, betting in sports and betting in cricket especially i mean because it was specifically restricted to cricket now uh, as far as present situation is concerned there is a law of 1867 it's called by the name of public uh, gambling act of 1867 and this is the one uh, which centrally governs gambling in india now this law has actually become irrelevant after 1947 because gambling and betting or whatever was made as a state subject under the list uh, under the schedule 7th of the constitution and uh, therefore uh, it's upon the state government to decide whether gambling uh, should be legalized or not or whatever and there should be a law with regards to that so therefore this particular law of 1867 which uh, seems like uh, age is back but is is completely absurd one is that and irrelevant now moving on to uh, which states in india have legalized sports betting so one is sikkim and the other uh, not sports betting gambling one is sikkim and the other one is goa so gambling overall in the country as i said is a state subject and only the states of sikkim and goa have legalized this act right now even if you look at uh, the state of sikkim and goa 
uh, online betting from other states is not allowed. So this betting which is there or gambling which is there in the states of Sikkim and Goa is actually physical in nature and is not uh, online. So if you are a Delhi ke resident, hai, so you cannot bet and uh, through online means you will it's only legally allowed in the states of Sikkim and Goa right now as far as uh, w what have been the controversies with regards to spot fixing and match fixing etc well uh, the first and the foremost or the the earliest uh, challenge or in the form of match fixing came in the year 2000 when uh, Hansi Crony had admitted who was the former captain of South Africa and he had admitted uh, to taking some money and throwing away matches as well as uh, uh, some of the other members of the South African team uh, had also acceded to it right and then once the bookie Mukesh Gupta who had been caught by Delhi police at that point of time uh, was uh, asked to make concession he also took name of some of the other prominent Indian cricketers including uh, Mohammad Azruddin and Ajay Jadeja right and then these people were subsequently handed bans for life and for some years and so on and so forth so this was uh, perhaps one of the first times uh, match fixing came to uh, limelight even though there there were issues uh, which had happened prior to that also where uh, Kapil Dev had made certain allegations where uh, even uh, Pakistani players and Australian players had made certain allegations that uh, bookies had approached them and uh, which included Steve Boy and Shane Vaughan etc and so on and so forth right now coming to the situation in recent times uh, there was a uh, scandal which took place in the IPL where some of the prominent uh, cricketers, those who had represented in India as well as uh, those who were part of uh, prominent IPL franchises had been uh, caught uh, red-handed or with certain proof etc and all that by the police for being involved in match fixing and spot fixing and then recently there have been a number of cases of uh, few Pakistani players and uh, a number of other names also coming up from IPL those who have been involved in spot fixing first of all you have to understand that what's the difference between match fixing and spot fixing I hope everyone knows that but just to reiterate it match fixing is that when so generally it's said that match fixing oh yeah match fixed uh, it's said that to fix a match is a very difficult thing for a simple reason that you have 22 players playing from both the teams and therefore it's impossible to buy out all the 22 players and the three umpires, the two umpires there on the field and buy the ball also <laughs> that you are going to move in this way or that way, right? So fixing a match is, is a very difficult uh, thing to do. Perhaps spot fixing or uh, catching hold of a couple of players and telling them that you throw away your wicket or you tell us that what is going to happen on the next ball or you tell us that you are going to bowl a no ball and so on and so forth is significantly much easier right now as far as the Lodha panel is concerned it has said that the betting in sports and betting particularly in cricket should be legalized and as far as match fixing is concerned and spot fixing is concerned it should be criminalized now if you look at the laws which are there in india with regards to match fixing and uh, uh, spot fixing etc are again uh, something which are not adept to deal with uh, the way the entire problem has evolved and therefore uh, the government and the parliament needs to relook at, at uh, the way it could be amended one is that now Apart from that, uh, now what is the current status of betting in sports as far as uh, the entire globe is concerned? So it said that the entire uh, betting industry when put together totally in the world is close to 400 billion dollars. That's a huge amount of money, 400 billion dollars, right? And countries like UK are very prominent. I mean, if you, uh, there are uh, bets which are placed on the English Premier League matches and a large number of cricket matches and so on and so forth, which are played in England, right? This is sports betting. This is 400 billion dollars of sports betting, right? Now, uh, if, if you uh, look at why this problem is so important or peculiar for India to be resolved is because especially if you look at cricket now India is one of the largest markets of cricket in the world and we have more than 80 to 90 percent of the viewership of the total entire viewership in the world even some of the most insignificant matches which are happening across the world are telecasted on Indian television 
right so uh, you have uh, we we are one of the largest viewing audience in the world and therefore one of the largest markets and because of commercials and so and so forth we remain to be the powerhouse uh, as far as uh, determining uh, the uh, the major concerns of cricketers there right and because in india cricket is such a huge sport uh, considered by some people as a religion and so on and so forth and there there is a huge following which is there for the sport of cricket uh, it's anticipated that already a lot of betting happens in the country because of the wide fanaticism which is there about the sport and therefore uh, this needs to be looked at it in a greater detail now what has uh, the lodha panel recommended first as i said that it has said that uh, uh it has a specific chapter which is there on match fixing and betting which is chapter 9 of the report in significant so it says that uh, it has made the recommendation to legalize betting except for those which are covered by the bcci and the ipl regulations and match fixing and spot fixing should be made a criminal offense with certain regards right now what what are these uh, certain safeguards which it has said in order to be introduced so that match fix uh, not match fixing uh, sports betting or cricket betting should be legalized right first it says that any of the sports person or officials or any of the staff members etc cannot be involved in betting right for a very simple reason that you are going to have a conflict of interest so if tomorrow a player starts betting on whether india is going to lose or win then uh, he will place his bet on that india is going to lose and uh, he is going to ensure everything which what can be done on the cricket field to make sure that the indian team loses right now one is that second it also says that it should be made mandatory for all the indian players the uh, all the officials related to cricket and all the staff related to cricket to uh, disclose their assets mandatorily simply something like what is done in the case of the civil servants right so that uh, there is a clear transparency or there is a transparency which is maintained with regards to the uh, the assets which these people own prior to a tournament and after a tournament or after a match and so on and so forth and all that right then it also says that uh, licenses would actually be issued to people those who would be placing bets and uh, it would be only after verification of their identification details and their age and so on and so forth and so that these people are in no way related to the cricket uh, functioning in the country right and uh, then uh, strict penal sanctions will also be imposed on those who will be transgressing the license and the other requirements right so uh, these are some of the recommendations which have been made by lodha panel specifically for uh, betting right so these are some of the safeguards which it has said should be introduced if betting has to be legalized in the country now moving on to whether betting should be legalized in india whether in cricket or in other sports also otherwise right so one uh, argument for is that this is a huge industry right and uh, people say that if you look at the betting industry in india only it is somewhere uh, in in the range of around 40 to 50000 crores and uh, it could actually easily accrue to the government around 10 to 12 12000 crore of money if a 30% taxation rate is applied अगर 30 परसेंट टैक्सेशन रेट लगाया जाता है तो 10 से बारह हजार करोड़ तक का मुनाफा या रेवेन्यू गवर्नमेंट के लिए जनरेट हो सकता है थ्रू लीगलाइजिंग बेटिंग एंड देन दिस मनी कुड सब्सिक्वेंटली बी यूज फॉर डेवलपिंग ग्रास रूट फैसिलिटीज इन इंडिया वेदर इट इज इन क्रिकेट और हॉकी और बॉक्सिंग और वट स्पोर्ट इट इज दैट मनी कुड एक्चुअली बी स्पेंड फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ द ग्रास रूट डेवलपमेंट ऑफ फैसिलिटीज एक्सेट्रा इन द स्पोर्ट्स second is that in 1996 there was a judgment which was given by the supreme court of india where supreme court of india had said that betting in horse racing is not illegal there was a case which was fought and supreme court had said that betting in horse racing is not illegal the argument which was put forward or the uh, the premise behind this ruling of the supreme court was that horse racing is not something as a matter of chance but rather its skill it's it, there are a certain number of skills which are involved in horse racing you train a horse and then you uh, judge 
on your own skill also that which horse is going to win or not and uh, what is good what is what are the conditions which are there and the track and so and so forth and it's it's a skill and there is uh, not uh, the element of chance is therefore significantly reduced and it's not exactly gambling it's betting and therefore since there is a science involved it is legal in nature now if the same thing is said but unfortunately or fortunately when supreme court had given out this judgment uh, in 1996 it had not very clearly said that whether this is applicable to other sports also or not whether betting in other sports is also legalized or not is, is something which the Supreme Court left to anyone's interpretation. But if one goes by that interpretation that there are skills involved in horse racing and therefore it is legal in nature and not an act of gambling as such, the same should be held true for the sport of cricket also. So therefore there are certain skills which are involved in the sport of cricket also and therefore uh, betting in cricket is also not illegal strictly speaking. Right. Uh, then uh, another uh, point of view which is put forward by a lot of people and the experience which has been seen in countries like UK is that uh, betting actually uh, legalizing the betting actually helps the investigating as well as the police agencies to trap any cases of match fixing or spot fixing much easier or much easily the reason for that is that suddenly in a particular event or in a particular match they are able to realize when there is a spike in betting or the number of bets which are placed because everything is legalized everything is regulated so therefore there will be disclosures which will be made this will make the entire process transparent information would be available with the police and they could be more vigilant in case of certain matches when they see that more and more number of bets are being placed so therefore they could be more careful with regards to the behavior of the players they could uh, keep a closer eye so for example this is a known fact in india that whenever india pakistan match is there that uh, the large number of bets are placed and therefore uh, you would see just before the match all these news reporters would flank uh, the commissioners of police here and there and ask them that what are you people doing and they will say that we got five people here those who were uh, betting and five people there because they know that these these are the times when more and more people involve themselves in betting right and therefore it might just happen for certain matches which might seem very insignificant large number of bets might be placed and this can help the police and the investigating agencies get more information and therefore crack down on any instances of spot mm -hmm. fixing and match fixing easily now these are the arguments which are there as far as uh, supporting match fixing or uh, <laughs> match fixing you bolta hu supporting uh, betting in sports or betting in cricket is concerned now what are the arguments which are against legalization of betting uh, in india and the first one they say is that uh, if you look at uh, sports is uh, another endeavor of human field and uh, there are certain ethics of sports also and betting in sports reduces the entire activity of playing sports to a mere uh, uh, to look it, looking at it in a very instrumental manner rather sports have a lot of emotions attached to it players have their players work hard for their entire life to uh, uh, go into an event or go into a particular competition etc and legalizing of the betting would actually ensure that people can put their money and put uh, that would uh, induce greater pressure on sports person for example if they come to know that higher bets have been placed on us perhaps that might create some sort of a uh, performance pressure on the players apart from this this also if you look into the uh, overall ethics with which uh, on which the sports are based this is against the ethos of the profession of sports as such right one is that second is that uh, already a large number of youth are attracted towards the game of cricket and to a large number of other sports also if you legalize betting then a lot of them might actually get drawn into betting and might lose their incomes and uh, their entire life savings and this would not only be true of the youth but also of any uh, middle-aged uh, people also and the kind of poverty which we have in our country it is very easy for people to get lured into such uh, uh, 
such idea in order to make short term money but what might happen is that all of these people might just be pushed down into the poverty and uh, therefore be uh, uh, and therefore lead to greater inequality in the society right apart from that there are certain other uh, philosophical reasons also given that uh, in our society if you look at it gambling is looked at as a very uh, is, is looked at as a social evil and therefore legalizing betting would also be uh, giving uh, acquiesce to this kind of an idea right so uh, plus apart from that the implementation and uh, the workforce of the security agencies or the investigating agencies and the police agencies etc is going to increase significantly much more if uh, sports betting is going to get legalized and therefore it would be even much tougher for them to decipher between what is illegal and what is legal and looking at the kind of uh, expertise which we have with the security forces and the investigating forces and police forces in india it uh, might uh, turn out to be a mammoth task to implement this law in earnest uh, uh, in the in the right ways now what what is the way forward well uh, the way forward perhaps is that there needs to be broader consultation which need to happen with the government uh, uh, and uh, the government needs to include all the stakeholders well as uh, i will be talking about the lodha panel uh, recommendations also uh, after lodha panel recommendations came out and it made scathing remarks about the working of the bcci uh, bcci as usual went into uh, the defensive mode and said that uh, we are going to form another panel who is going to look into the recommendation of the lodha panel and then we will see that which of these recommendation are feasible or not and then we will implement them right so uh, the same thing has sort of happened in the case of uh, uh, betting also but perhaps the time has come for india to re uh, reconsider its view on betting for a very simple reason that as i said revenue is going to get generated and then the more you push or make anything illegal the more you push that uh, activity behind uh, below the carpet but that does not necessarily mean that that activity is no longer happening and in fact the ways in which that activity can happen can uh, it can lead to sinister results when compared to when it is when that particular activity is legalized right even though uh, it there are there are no uh, conclusive proof which one could say that uh, if betting is legalized uh, spot fixing and match fixing are going to stop that's definitely not going to happen because uh, this is in human nature to cheat and to deceit and to uh, you know uh, to uh, forge other people and therefore uh, match fixing and uh, sports betting etc uh, sports fixing etc uh, spot fixing etc would continue the only way to deal with that would be that the offenders should be given such strictest of the strictest punishment that they do not even think of involving themselves in this a uh, kind of an activity going ahead or perhaps you need to provide uh, greater uh, training in ethics and so on and so forth to the players also they need to be trained in such a way to be taught that the uh, profession which they have taken up is a very noble sport and uh, is a very noble profession in uh, to which a lot of people look up to right people have a lot of emotions associated with sports and the, the pride of the country is at the stake and therefore uh, perhaps being involved in match fixing or uh, spot fixing or any of such activities is perhaps the worst thing they could be doing as a sports person right not only uh, towards uh, this would be a disservice towards the sports but it would be a disservice towards the nation and emotions of millions and millions of people right so this is about uh, betting in sports and whether it should be legalized or not and what are the safeguards which have been suggested by the lodha panel and then what's been the history of uh, sports betting in india and uh, what is the current status with regards to it yes so how would you distinguish between uh, betting and gambling how would i distinguish between betting and gambling so i think as again so that's what i did and that's a question which came to my mind uh, there is no strict definition which uh, differs both of them but uh, again if you go by the ruling of the supreme court gambling is something which is a matter of chance and luck whereas uh, in uh, betting you have a particular science and some certain skills involved and you are analyzing and then putting in your money right so that's that's perhaps how supreme court looks at it sorry 
So see, if you look at it, gambling is actually not illegal. The reason for it, it by law, I am by law. See, the thing is that uh, now that's the con the conflict. Huh? It, they are allowed. They, huh, they are allowed in Goa and Sikkim because the state. So see, the problem is that this is also one another anomaly and a very funny situation. No, rest of India it is not. Only in Goa and Sikkim, and the 1867 law governs the entire country. But actually, after 1947, when we made three, you know, lists in the constitution, gambling was made a state subject, right? So two states have allowed it. And earlier, few other states also used to allow it. Then they brought in laws to, uh, you know, uh, lottery and everything was done away with. Lottery is, com is actually gambling. But this is an anomaly in the law which uh, no one has actually bothered to address in a way. Right? So is the fine for illegal, uh, illegal betting or gambling is still the same meager amount of 200? Or is it, it depends on the state? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, this is what it this says, but I have not read through the law, so I, I cannot uh, tell about that. Okay. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the governance in cricket and the Lodha panel recommendation. So, basically, the Lodha panel recommendation, as all of you would know, was formed after there were a lot of irregularities which were found in the working of the BCCI and even uh, the allegation with respect to the working of the Chennai Super Kings franchisee and Rajasthan Royals, etc., in the IPL. And uh, some of the relatives of uh, the president of the BCCI uh, were caught to were caught uh, in and uh, were involved in uh, match uh, betting activities and then apart from that uh, the president of the BCCI was also said to have certain conflict of interest and so on and so forth and large number of things right now uh, what so if you look at the current status of the BCCI BCCI is basically a body which is registered as a society under the Societies Act of 1863 and uh, therefore it is an independent and an autonomous body and uh, which does not uh, be, uh, bear any allegiance to the government of India as such. In fact, uh, uh, quite shockingly at time, uh, once upon a time uh, in a reply the BCCI had said that uh, the Indian cricket team actually does not represent India as such but represents the BCCI. Right. So, uh, I mean, this perhaps came as a shock uh, to a large number of cricket lovers, those who said that, okay, if Indian cricket team does not represent India and represents BCCI, then God knows uh, what uh, BCCI is in existence for or why should one support the Indian cricket team. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, but if you look at it uh, in, in another way, uh, BCCI actually does receive a lot of benefits from the government, right. First of all, uh, more than 90% uh, of the posts which are there in the BCCI are manned by people uh, from the government or those who are from the politics, right? So, uh, or they would have something to do with the ruling party. So, that is one thing. Second is, uh, if you look at it directly, they get a large number of tax benefits, right? A large num uh, number of times uh, they are given exemption in entertainment fee and so on and so forth. Plus, uh, they also get uh, money in form of... Uh, the uh, stadium uh, banane ke liye jo land milta hai wo kam paise par ya subsidized cost pe mil jata hai security arrangement which is made by the indian government by the indian police forces for the players and for the other traveling officials and so on and so forth all of obviously is done at the expense of the taxpayers money so it uh, is completely absurd of the bcci to say that uh, it's not a government body because uh, if uh, it draws uh, such significant amount of uh, benefits from the government and from the taxpayers money it has to be obviously accountable to the people also but unfortunately it, it is not right now uh, also the question comes that uh, should actually the government be intervening in the BCCI when BCCI is actually one of the most uh, uh, successful sports uh, body or sports federation in India. In fact, perhaps cricket is the only sport, uh, uh, maybe not in the recent times, but uh, if you look at uh, the last two, three decades, which has been able to uh, generate so much amount of revenue and money for the players and been able to uplift the life of many, right? Whereas when you look at uh, even uh, the ace boxers or chess champions and kabaddi players and so on and so forth they still languish in uh, poverty now uh, well the state should intervene or not one is that as far as india is concerned especially in the case of cricket it definitely should right 
not only because it gets these tax benefits and monetary benefits and incentives etc but also because of a reason that they are using the the uh, the name of the country when they represent at international events they are not so it it's very absurd of bcci to say that they actually represent bcci and not india because they are actually carrying the tricolor they are carrying the in the in they represent the aspirations and uh, the hopes of millions and millions of indians right one is that uh, the second also is that uh, sports in general have a certain sentimental value attached to it right and even though this question keeps coming up recurrently that whether we should uh, go for hosting sports uh, events like olympics or cwg etc and all of that but it does project your country as one one of the uh, upcoming uh, leaders in, in the global stage and it uh, shows the uh, capability of your nation as uh, uh, as uh, as a role model for a large number of other countries and so on and so forth and it does establish your credibility and therefore sports is not such a simple zero sum game perhaps they might not lead to the uh, the direct development of people or the upliftment of a large number of people but they have a large uh, significant emotional moral and uh, you know aspirational value attached to them and therefore state intervention has to be there at some point of time at least there has to be minimal state regulation which has to be there right now what are the controversies which are there with regards to the uh, bcci as such as uh, as far as bcci is concerned well if you look at it uh, bcci is another name for controversy right it has always been involved in uh, a large number of controversies in the recent times whether uh, you look at uh, the scandal which uh, was sort of or the alleged scandal which was uh, put forward by some of the aam aadmi party members against the ddca bodies and now there is a case uh, which is being fought uh, in the uh, delhi high court with regards to the alleged uh, corruption and the uh, malefied activities etc in the ddca apart from that uh, the entire functioning of bcci is shrouded in such mystery and uh, secrecy that uh, it's anyone's guess that how does this particular body function behind the doors then on top of that uh, you would have seen that there are these uh, uh, commentators which are hired by the bcci right uh, it, it has happened several times in the past that if any player or if any commentator has uh, criticize the BCCI that uh, particular person was either dropped from the panel or from the team or so and so forth right so uh, perhaps uh, freedom of speech of people have been curbed down just because criticism of a particular body has uh, taken place then uh, the lack of accountability in the functioning of the BCCI it is not accountable to anyone they are accountable to themselves there is no independent ombudsman which is there they are not independent to the government they are not independent to the people they are not independent to the courts also they feel right so they they have sort of become uh, bodies which are above the law apart from that uh, you have various zones which are there in the bcci and there are interzonal conflicts which keep taking place between these zones so uh, till now we have these five selectors from five zones who uh, select the indian cricket team and therefore at times it has been witnessed that some of the most uh, uh, demeritorious candidates have been selected uh, to the Indian cricket team or the non-meritorious candidates have been selected to the Indian cricket team simply because they belong to a particular zone and there were no uh, meritorious candidates those who were uh, eligible or enough from that particular zone and uh, therefore all of this does come at the cost of the, uh, the selection and the performance of the uh, Indian cricket team and that does uh, harm the interest of the country right and then there have been uh, large uh, allegations of revenue management uh, irregularities and so on and so forth and all these things right now uh, well one cannot uh, argue that BCCI is one of the richest cricket boards in the world in fact the richest cricket board in the world and is actually uh, the one which determines how uh, the other cricket uh, or the cricket events take place across the world right such is the power of the bcci that uh, it can decide whether other countries player can come and play in the ipl but none of indian players actually go and play in play in the 
foreign leagues across the world whether it is in west indies or in australia pakistan bangladesh none of indian player actually go and represent so this is the kind of power which uh, the bcci has there was a parallel league which had been started a few uh, started few years back in the form of the indian cricket league icl and uh, all the players those who had uh, pl taken part in the icl and all the ex cricketers those who had been a part of icl were actually banned from uh, being associated with the bcci in any form for future just simply or simply because the bcci uh, felt that uh, it was compromising their interest uh, without any proper explanation then apart from that there have been a large number of irregularities which have happened in the form of the functioning of the ipl also uh, so there have been uh, conflict of interest then uh, match fixing and match betting and all these things which have happened in uh, the ipl have not been dealt uh, with a strong hand by the bcci and uh, then uh, large number of state associations are unequally represented at the bcci for example bihar which is one of the most popular state in the country does not have a representation in form of its cricket team right same goes for the state of chatisgarh chatisgarh, chatisgarh does not have a cricket team but uh, interestingly you have a cricket team from vidarbha you have a cricket team from mumbai you have a cricket team from saurashtra right you have a cricket team from gujarat but you do not have a cricket team from bihar or you say do not have uh, states from northeast representing in the ranji trophy you have just the state of tripura uh, where a team is there you do not have a team uh, or assam you do not have a team for manipur or nagaland or mizoram or whatever yes yeah yeah Run, uh, all the domestic cricket which takes place and the international cricket which indian team plays is regulated by the bcci how come this state government decide that the players from sri lanka will be participating in state governments usually there is a statement from the state government would oh, that's because of politics that's another thing okay that they say ki matlab nahi aane denge nahi khelne denge and all that bcci agrees to it because it's uh, no lesser than a political body itself yes can prohibit even uh, indirectly they can prohibit a state for example they were not yeah they can so they can so what they did to for example rajasthan so rajasthan uh, there was a stronghold of lalit modi which was there i mean this is just you know not really relevant but in a way if you look at it uh, rajasthan cricket association has been uh, hard done as a lot of people say where the state association has been derecognized by the bcci simply because lalit modi was uh, the honorary member or the president or whatever right and he had a very strong hold on the rajasthan cricket association so that has been de recognized and players from rajasthan are in a limbo now they do not know that uh, whom should they approach if they have to get uh, the facilities improved or their salaries or money or whatever they do not have any association because the association been de recognized no participation they are participating but i don't know how they are participating <laughs> see it's a unfortunate fact then uh, what hap started happening was players from rajasthan started migrating to other states they started playing for other states that's what started happening they uh, signed up contracts with other state governments and state yeah, association it it yeah bcci yes because there is so there is no association of uh, bihar bihar does not have a cricket team that uh, uh, your uh, as i said chatisgarh does not have a cricket team so if chatis players from chatisgarh have to actually go and fight it out in uh, madhya pradesh to get selected and there also obviously they are discriminated that was one of the reasons why people from chatisgarh wanted to have a separate state for themselves so the same discrimination carries on there is no separate team for there is a team for jharkhand but there is no team for bihar there is no uh, bihar state cricket association as you might call it there was one there was one i think the uh, uh, lalu prasad yadav was it uh, president it gets to be huh. recognized even if it it's formed by the state initiative people of the, that state it, it needs to be recognized by this this is then only they will be playing in the it needs sorry i didn't get your question even if the initiative of the people of a state they form a state cricket association huh. but until and unless yeah until and unless bcci does not recognize and until and unless bcci does not allow them to play in the tournament how can they participate because it's organized by the bcci bcci takes care of all the cricket domestic cricket in the country until and unless it's informal cricket which you play in the backyard of your house right 
ओके सो वॉट आर दी मेजर रिकमेंडेशन विच हैव बीन मेड बाय दी लोधा पैनल सो देर आर लार्ज नंबर ऑफ दीज रिकमेंडेशन विच हैव बीन गिवन इन यूर नोट्स आई विल जस्ट टॉक अबाउट ऑफ सम वेरी फ्यू ऑफ दीज रिकमेंडेशन दी फर्स्ट वन इज दैट इट सेज दैट देर इज नो यूनिफॉर्मिटी इन दी स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ दी Uh, state associations across the country so some of them are registered as societies some of them are registered as companies right and uh, therefore uh, there is no uniformity in the structure there is no uniformity in the functioning there is no uniformity in the uh, the number of members each of these associations have and uh, they are mostly uh, political organizations is what the loda panel has commented another thing it has said is that uh, only one association from each state would be allowed to vote in the bcci council right so you would have only one vote from each state and for only one association would be recognized that is gujarat will have only one association chatisgarh will have only one association and not that you will have one for gujarat one for saurashtra one for mumbai one for uh, maharashtra one for vidarbha right so for example in maharashtra you have three cricket association vidarbha cricket association Maharashtra Cricket Association and then you have a Mumbai Cricket Association right similarly uh, in Gujarat you have another you know two uh, cricket association so all of this needs to be done away with and there needs to be one similarly you have a cricket team of Hyderabad and then you have a cricket team of Andhra Pradesh also right so all of this needs to be done away with and there needs to be one single association representing one state that is one thing another thing it has come out with is it says that there has to be a fixed term which has to be given to the members of the bcci and there has to be a ban on politicians and bureaucrats from holding the office of the bcci one is that second it has also said that today there is a lot of centralization of the powers in the bcci all of the powers are vested in the president of the bcci there needs to be a decentralization of powers which needs to take place and therefore they should have an apex council and there should be a ceo and the ceo should be held directly accountable to this apex council and this apex council should have representation of so there will be some elected members of this apex council i i don't uh, have the exact number i think this five five should be elected and two of them should be the representatives of the players association another thing which it has said is that all the cricketing duties or the cricketing related work should be only allocated to ex cricketers no politicians should be taking care of so uh, whether, when it is selecting the chairman uh, panel uh, or the uh, panel of the selector sorry or whether it is uh, selecting the chairman of that uh, selection panel all of it should be done by the ex cricketers only and not so that ex cricketer should and that ex the definition of ex cricketer is not that if you have played local club cricket but if you have represented your state in ranji cricket right so that that is when you will be qualified to be called as a ex cricketer now then it has also said that uh, bcci and ipl should have separate governing bodies and uh, they should be governed separately bcci is a separate entity ipl is a separate entity and both of them should not have anything to do with each other one is that uh another it has said is that uh, the <clears throat> there should be an ombudsman officer an ethics officer and an election officer to look into the three contentious issues with the functioning of the bcci that includes the cases of corruption transparency and accountability and uh, any issues of conflict resolution and an election officer to ensure that the elections which take place to the apex council of the bcci are and the state cricket associations are done in a fair and a transparent manner right so uh, these are some of the recommendations as far as the lodha panel is concerned so what could be the implications of the lodha panel well first is uh, that it would usher in an era of transparency as far as uh, the entire cricketing uh, structure in the country is concerned there have been a large number of cases of uh, conflict of interest which have been witnessed in the recent past uh, even the indian cricket team captain has been accused of having conflict of interest and perhaps those kind of issues could be addressed uh, going ahead then it would overall improve the governance structure of uh, the cricketing bodies in the country and therefore uh, there are uh, uh, 
alleged uh, th there are a lot of allegations which are there against the working of uh, several cricket associations as i said in case of uh, uh, you know bihar you have lalu prasad yadav who is the president of the state cricket association maharashtra or i think perhaps vidarbh had uh, sharad pawar as the head of the cricket association and so on and so forth plus it also said that if someone is a member of the state cricket association he cannot be a member of the bcci he cannot be a post holder in the bcci also right and then uh, the loda panel has also said that bcci should come under the rti act right uh, interestingly also what happened was if you people would remember there was a sports authority bill which had been introduced or something like that uh, in 2012 or 13 by the uh, erstwhile uh, sports and youth affairs minister uh, mr ajay makan but what actually happened was that bcci said that so there were a lot of uh, provisions which wanted to make uh, the governance of the sports bodies and federations more transparent that included the 25% uh, reservation for the players or the ex players in these uh, associations that included all these bodies should come under the ambit of the RTI act well bcci blatantly at that point of time said that we are not a government body we are not a federation which is funded by the government we do not take any money from the government and therefore we will not come under the RTI and so on and so forth so uh, this is as far as the loda panel and the governance of uh, cricket in india is concerned even though uh, perhaps this topic might have been a little specific in nature but you could just extend the same kind of arguments about uh, the other uh, federations in india also if any one of you have mentioned boxing or watching boxing or any of your interests or hobbies as boxing or something like that perhaps a boxing federation is also in a lot of turmoil and thus the same goes for uh, the uh, hockey federation you have two india is a very strange country we have two bodies which were uh, you know fighting it out that which is the one which has legal authority for boxing uh, for hockey right so pata hi nahi tha ki kaun si wali ke ke team khelegi ja ke international usme so same is the case of with the other sports also there have been allegations of corruption in badminton also and uh, selection issues and this and that and so many other things okay now moving on to the next topic this one is about the educational qualification for contesting the election this is a very short topic so just uh, quickly run through this so as you all would know that uh, there was uh, uh, an ordinance which had been passed in the rajasthan government and then there was uh, a law which had been passed in uh, the uh, haryana also with regards to putting co educational qualification on the uh, members uh, on the citizens for fighting elections to the panchayati raj right now uh, what uh, has strangely also happened after that is that uh, the uh, supreme court of india has uh, come out uh, supreme court or high court uh, supreme court hi hoga supreme court na in the rajwala case of 2015 so in the rajwala case the supreme court has declared that uh, this is perfectly fine and uh, this is nothing which is unconstitutional now first of all there are just two three parts of this topic one is that what is the need for having such qualification well uh, you have even after independence of the country for almost more than 70 you know almost 70 years now uh, we uh, still have a large number of politicians and members of panchayati raj and state legislative assemblies etc those who are illiterate and those who are not well equipped enough to be able to deal with the requirements of uh, or the task which uh, a politician or which a representative of the people should have right one of the severe criticisms of the panchayati raj institution or the challenges which they face is that they do not have functionaries they do not have technical expertise they do not have the right kind of people to lead these organizations right and how is that going to happen when uh, as statistics suggest that more than 40% of uh, the members of the panchayati raj institutions in india do not even hold a degree or do not uh, even hold the qualification of uh, passing the 8th class exam right so this, therefore you cannot expect that these people would have the right uh, kind of ability and understanding of the issues uh, to be able to deal with uh, the complex problems which uh, come up in governance one is that uh, apart from that is that uh, 
देर इज नो डाउट दैट एजुकेशन डज हेल्प अ पर्सन टू डिस्क्रिमिनेट द राइट फ्रॉम रॉन्ग एंड सेट दी प्रायोरिटीज प्रॉपरली पर हैप्स फॉर एन इलिटरेट मैन दी प्रायोरिटीज वुड बी वेरी डिफरेंट बट फॉर एन एजुकेटेड मैन प्रायोरिटीज वुड बी हेल्थ एंड एजुकेशन एंड सैनिटेशन एंड सो एंड सो फोर्थ ही वुड नो दी इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ दीज थिंग्स मोर देन एनी पर्सन हु इज नॉट हैड अ फॉर्मल एजुकेशन वन इज दैट then uh, apart from that uh, again uh, this would perhaps create a pressure and a movement for widespread uh, literacy and education in the country because once you would be required to having a particular educational qualification you would have to go, uh, at least uh, you know educate yourself and in the process you would end up educating a large number of people and therefore it would create a push to uh, educate people in the country now well uh, as far as uh, the counter arguments to this is concerned and then there is this heading of what does this qualification mean for people of these states you can put all of that in the counter arguments and arguments only well uh, as far as the counter arguments to this is concerned one is that you will be excluding a large number of people from democratic process and uh, you would be excluding especially the most downtrodden uh, trodden sections of the society from being involved in the democratic process the constitution of india does not discriminate between an educated or an uneducated person then how can you do that one is that second is that this was an apprehension which was there at the time of the independence of india also that uh, if we are going to have a universal adult franchise then we are going to hand this country over to millions and millions of illiterates in the country to decide that who is going to govern them but when the constituent assembly of the country or the uh, the first pal or the uh, the uh, the in the earlier leaders of our country did not take into consideration the education background but rather said that franchisee the right of franchisee should be available to each and every citizen of the country irrespective of his sex caste creed religion or his educational status or his place of residence or whatever it is then why should we discriminate today on our own right then uh, also there is no conclusive proof that uh, the most educated people are the ones those who are the best administrators you have examples of people like uh, d raja you have examples of people like suresh kalmadi you have examples of uh, numerous other people those who have highly educated but have been involved in a large number of scams those who have been always accused of misgovernance those who have not been able to deliver results at uh, at any level whether it is state or uh, the center or whether it is the panchayati raj so then how can you conclusively say that only education is going to change the outlook of the people second is that as i said as an argument that uh, uh, perhaps someone who is more educated would understand the importance of education health and uh, sanitation etc better but the opposite is also very much valid person who is actually illiterate would know the importance of health education and uh, facilities such as sanitation the most as compared to someone who has been brought up in an environment where he already had access to these facilities because he knows that what it is to be without education and to be without access to health facilities and to be without access to the basic amenities of life and therefore he would be a, he would be the one who would be the most passionate about to push through for or push for uh, providing or provision of these facilities to the citizens right as far as the supreme court of india is concerned uh, supreme court of india in the rajbala case had uh, mentioned some of the arguments i'll just read it out from your uh, notes only it said that uh, illiteracy lack of sanitation etc are actually due to the requisite will and the lack of the requisite will rather than poverty as the main reason also it says that uh, it is the education which gives the human being a power to uh, discriminate between the right and the wrong and the good and the bad and therefore there is nothing wrong in putting an educational qualification on the members of the panchayati raj plus it is also said that uh, this will uh, elect a model uh, government or a model uh institution of panchayati raj and therefore help assure in a era of good governance at the democratic at the grassroots level also now uh, 
there, there is a critical analysis of the order which has been given in your uh, notes so you could just read through them and again the arguments which are against plus a few of them that uh, the judgment is uh, against the stated objectives of the 73rd amendment in the constitution and uh, which actually wanted to ensure that there should be sufficient representation of the insufficiently represented sections of the society including the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes, the women etc. Now basically when you bring in such a legislation you would actually be going counter to that entire spirit of the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendment simply because of a reason that you will not allow uh, these women or the people from the, the downtrodden sections of the society where the literacy rates are very low and therefore this emphasis of the government should be on ensuring universalization of education better implementation of the rte act rather than uh, forcing people to go and study and rather our focus should be on vocational education and meaningful education which can actually provide livelihood to the people than just pushing them through into some sort of a black hole of uh, schools or colleges or educational uh, institutions where they might not be able to make any economic sense out of it right so uh, these are some of the arguments for and against you can form whatever opinion you want to on your own but again be very firm in your opinion and be very clear in terms of what are the arguments and counter arguments which are there and even if say it happens in the interview that the interview board so you say for example say that yes there should be educational qualification which should be put forward and the someone in the interview board tells you that no uh, this is not uh, you know this is the counter argument which i have and if you are not able to find a valid argument to counter that counter argument you might as well submit to it and say that yes sir or ma'am i agree to this particular point what you are making but at the same time there are a large number of other benefits also which might be accrued because of this so there is one way where you say that yes you are right i stand corrected my opinion needs to be changed or i change my opinion that shows that you do not have enough firmness in your opinions and you do not have enough enough conviction in whatever you have thought yourself right rather have that conviction have that firmness but do not be adamant also if the board member again tells you ki no then you say ki, okay i am sorry i stand corrected but if if someone's just uh, trying to poke you and see that whether you stand firm with your opinion and your argument stand by it but at the same time learn to accept or learn to agree to disagree also right so you could always agree to disagree and say that yes that's uh, definitely a valid point but still in my opinion this is a much better option than uh, perhaps not having an educational qualification or vice versa right uh, now moving on to the next question uh, next uh, not question the topic uh, quickly this one is about the aadhaar card and the privacy debate and all that so again uh, i think your entire document is actually very comprehensive in nature but still i'll just uh, run through this one so first of all uh, in and in fact uh, what has been uh, done in the budget speech of the uh, finance minister Arun Jaitley is that he has said that the aadhaar card is now going to or the uidi is going to get a legal author, uh, legal sanction and therefore there will be a bill which will be introduced in the parliament to uh, give it a statutory status right and therefore putting to rest a lot of doubts which are there about the functioning of the aadhaar so see first of all uh, all of you know about the benefits of aadhaar the jam trinity and you could read through the economic survey of the last year and then all those things and uh, you know you could read about how dbt uh, could come into uh, being because of the use of aadhaar card and how leakages could be curbed down upon how uh, we could be having better delivery of services and uh, it could help in curb down on the instances of generation of black money and the corruption in the public service delivery and so on and so forth so all of these things are there all of that is adequately mentioned in your notes then uh, moving on to the next aspect of it that is the privacy versus the aadhaar debate this is the major debate which is there on which uh, uh, there was uh, PIL which had been fined in the Supreme Court and uh, the government of India which was represented by the Attorney General had said that because Aadhaar seeks to provide citizens 
and improve the citizen uh, service delivery in the country and provide them benefits in order to get those benefits at times citizens have to let go of some of their uh, freedom and some of their rights and that one of those right includes rights includes the right to privacy this this is what was the view which had been put forward by the government in the supreme court and which uh, supreme court obviously did not uh, agree to and uh, supreme court said that uh, well uh, if if you look at the historical uh, evolution of uh, the right to privacy in the country through various judgments of the supreme court it has now been clearly accepted as one of the fundamental rights which is very closely related to the right to liberty which has been uh, given to uh, or sorry the right to life which has been given to the citizens under sec, uh, article 21 of the constitution right now uh, plus apart from that there are a large number of uh, international conventions also which talk about the right to privacy of the citizens which range from uh, the european convention on the human rights and the united nations charter of 1945 and the universal declaration of the human rights and so on and so forth and uh, yeah so now what are why are these concerns regarding the aadhar card and privacy there that's what you need to understand in the first place the data which is being taken by the uh, uidi is very sensitive in nature where they are taking all your biometric credentials where they are taking your name and your address and this and that and so much information this information might just be misused by either the government agencies or by the private agencies now government agencies might just uh, misuse it in form of racial profiling or profiling of the people or the criminals and so on and so forth and which might uh, lead to a uh, lot of social issues as such you might just uh, start profiling for example people from a particular community and uh, you might come out with a statistic that okay 40% of the people from this community are criminals and then you would attach a label to it and say that uh, the people from this community are generally criminals and they com commit theft and therefore it would lead to tensions in the society right one is that second is that uh, there is a lack of account ah. See that is there, but the thing is that when the census is there, the perhaps the information which is collected is significantly. So census happens first of all every ten years, right? यहाँ पे आपके ना अगर आपके पास एक बार आधार कार्ड आ गया, so you will be use it using it almost on a daily basis, right? So I could keep a track of what you do, what you don't do, what are the kind of activities which you are involved in, where do you go, where do you move. what do you eat which hospitals do you visit everything could be tracked off that's not the case in case of the census data that's a very static data which you get profiling and everything could be done there also and that's why a lot of people are against having caste based census and having uh, you know census on huge why should you ask for religion and so on and so forth and that's for therefore government is always very uh, careful in releasing data with regard to religion and religious data and all that when what it has come out in the census it does not release it very easily it releases it after only a certain time and it is made sure that there is nothing which is going to affect the law and order in the society right when this data biometric thing has been collected huh. so uh, biometric see again biometric is another level of information i mean you are going to another depth of information is what you have to understand right so aap sirf aap sirf uh, biometric ke basis ke upar aap biometric data ke basis ke upar tomorrow some kind of technologies might aap iris ka wo le rahe ho aap fingerprinting le rahe ho Prof the entire profiling of a person could be done in such a way which might be significantly more uh, you know penetrative than static data ha aap usko matlab aap bahut sari cheezon se relate uh, kiya ja sakta hai yes just a position data ka sir aur kuch data ka. so here the complexity of the data is much more because you have much more information available इन सेंसस डेटा आपके पास से पांच या छह या सात इन्फॉर्मेशन पीसेस होते हैं यहाँ पे आपके पास आदमी का ऑलमोस्ट यू हैव द एंटायर प्रोफाइल ऑफ द पर्सन व्हाट इज इज स्किन कलर व्हाट इज इज आई कलर व्हाट इज इज फिंगरप्रिंट एंड फ्रॉम फिंगरप्रिंट यू कैन डिसाइड फॉर सम टेन अदर थिंग्स एंड सो एंड सो फोर्थ एंड ऑल दैट सो यू हैव होल लॉट ऑफ इन्फॉर्मेशन विच इज अवेलेबल एट योर पेरेंट
aren't there chances of this data being misused? For example, such so that Sumanda Puskar's case, his minister's fingerprints are there. Because there is no yeah, so there. your information, so no, I mean, see, in case of criminal uh, cases, etc., it might just help, but... No, no, it huh. be the regulatory authority of this Aadhaar is not a constitutional Yeah, so that's what, see, I mean, I'll come to that point later. He was asking that this data is available in the census ke case mein bhi hai, uske case. Mein bhi hai. Ye bhi ek argument hai, wo main us pe tha, but anyways, haan, aap bata na, is bold. <coughs> exactly. Yes, so they, they, there might be a lot of compl see the data which you are collecting as I said data points are a lot more right and you might come out with some subset tomorrow ki yaar ye jo aisi aankh ke type ke log hote hain inka aisa wo hota hai right behavior hota something like that you might just come out with some absurd study and you might just start relating it to it people already uh, you know label that okay why are all the terrorists in the world only muslims so tomorrow this might start also uh, also start happening then another uh, labeling would happen then another labeling would happen right yes yeah so yeah so that is uh, so the now moving on to the other concerns with regards to the uidi in the Aadhaar is that see it does not have any legal statutory backing it yeah hmm. No, no, private agencies can have access to the data, no? Because uh, organizations like T TCS, etc., are the ones those who are working on top of Aadhaar to make apps. But the server is, they are the implementers of this, this, this data, but the moment it gets registered, they are the server. See, again, that's the, that's the concern. So, what you are saying, if that's the concern that you are indirectly providing private agencies with this data right because there is some sort of an access which you are giving to them either okay so government says that no no we have enough security measures in place right the government says that that no private agency is ever going to get hang on to that data but in a country where i mean there have been such fraud cases which have happened where uh, data of uh, millions and millions of customers of uh, Deutsche Bank etc were and city banks were released to the call center agencies and to various telecallers etc and sensitive data has been released how can you trust the government on something like this that is what the concern is right so this is suspicious this is like this is suspicion which people have and therefore they are saying ki bhai, ensure that there is proper security there are proper security measures which are there in place on top of that you do not have any legal backing you do not have any constitutional backing you are not going to be accountable to anyone right you 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 are not accountable to the uh, parliament of india you are not accountable to the government you are not accountable to anyone you are an executive agency your your uh, government has given an executive order created you you are getting money you are working on your own and uh, something happens tomorrow who are, whom are who is going to be accountable that is the the question which they have and then uh, again the seeding and lack of accountability and you know ye, ye jo seeding wala cheez likha hai, that they, they, this is about the introduction of the Aadhaar number into different databases once this number is seeded into various databases it makes convergence of personal information remarkably uh, remarkably simple so if the number is in the gas agency the bank the ticket the ration card the voter id and so on and so forth uh, there are others also who can learn to use what is called the ID platform and can seed the citizen at will. So all of these concerns are there with regards to the Aadhaar card and uh, the Aadhaar as such. But see, there are a large number of benefits which are associated with Aadhaar. Now that's uh, something which is undeniable. When this government had come into uh, being and uh, when they were in the opposition, the NDA, they used to criticize the government a lot, criticize Nandan Nelikani a lot that what is this? We have spent crores and crores of money, nothing has happened. We are going to you know, do away with Aadhaar and so on and so forth. They gave all that rhetoric and now they realize that we, you do need uh, numbers, something like that of social security number in the USA in order to have better identification of benef beneficiaries and uh, better delivery of services and so on and so forth. So you definitely need to have something like that. There is no doubt about it. And especially moving ahead, as I said, with Jam Trinity. And if you have to utilize technology, 
uh, and uh, delivery of services through mobile apps and so on and so forth aadhar will be an indispensable tool for the government to do that but the concern is that what the, the stance which was taken by the government at the supreme court that uh, the privacy has to be the right to privacy has to be foregone in lieu of getting some services that is something which is not acceptable and perhaps uh, the government in a way has already acceded to that demand uh, partially by uh, you know agreeing to uh, create a statutory body and uh, now perhaps the next step would be to introduce several other measures to ensure the security of the data which is available with the uidi and therefore make aadhar a sustainable practical as well as a secure solution for a large number of governance problems in the country right so this is uh, as far as today's class is concerned right in case just in case if you uh, have any other topics to be suggested to uh, for taking in any of the other classes because kuch economics ke topics wagera suggest kiye gaye the wo class ho nahi paayi hai so that plus uh, some of the polity topics could be merged so my email id is uh, jatin dot g at the rate of vision i s dot in drop in your topic suggestion at this id also uh, i noticed that this generally otherwise also uh, because abhi email id se mere ko dhyan aaya ki some of the people keep uh, mailing me their answers etc and tell them tell me ki aap please evaluate kar do isko mere paas itna time sachchi mein nahi hota hai ki main unko evaluate kar saku so best ye hoga ki aap agar kabhi aap mere ko kismat se aapko main mil jaun center pe वहाँ कहूँ बात तो मे बी यू कैच होल्ड ऑफ मी देयर और अदरवाइज देर आर नंबर ऑफ अदर फैकल्टी दोज हु आर अवेलेबल फुल टाइम डेडिकेटेड टू दिस काइंड ऑफ अ पर्पज होम यू कैन अप्रोच एट द सेंटर इन ऑर्डर टू गेट एनी क्वेरीज और डाउट्स रिजॉल्व ऑन योर आंसर्स एंड योर आंसर राइटिंग एंड ऑल दैट काइंड ऑफ थिंग राइट इट्स इम्पॉसिबल फॉर मी टू गो थ्रू एन आंसर कॉपी बिकॉज दैट्स नॉट वॉट यू नो आई डू नॉट हैव टाइम फॉर दैट ऑन स्पीकिंग